That's a wrap on the televised leaders' debates in this federal election campaign. Thursday's the only English language debate, and the liberal leader was in the crosshairs of the other candidates. Did any of them make an impression? Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location, practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. The one thing not clearly answered by Justin Trudeau in the debate was why he called the election in the first place. Usually in the debates, everyone wants to make an impression, maybe a knockout punch on the table for discussion, climate change, indigenous reconciliation, affordability, and the COVID-19 pandemic. The issues were selected by the Federal Election Broadcast Group. Our unpublished.vote question asks you, do, do the debates help you make up your mind over who you'll vote for? Yes, no, or unsure. You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote. Well, we're 10 days away from heading to the ballot box for the 44th federal election, and polls are showing a tight race between the Conservatives and the Liberals, but nobody is sniffing around majority territory. Coming up on the show, we'll chat with Daryl Bricker, CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs as well. David McDonald, Senior Economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. First, somebody who's been around uh, a few debates and elections. Warren Kinsella is a political commentator and special advisor to former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. And Warren, uh, were there any clear winners or losers last night? I felt O'Toole and Paul did really well. And, um, you know, Paul, I, I think a lot of us admired her. Unlike everybody else on stage, she's not a professional politician. You know, it's, it makes you kind of nervous being in a circumstance like that. But she acquitted herself, herself quite well. And she had that just devastating exchange with Trudeau, mm -hmm. where he actually seemed to be speaking to her, a woman, about what feminism really was. And she, you know, invoked the names of Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott and just left Trudeau looking wounded. O'Toole, I felt, uh, was the beneficiary of last night. Not that he scored any points, but he was, you know, the Marshall McLuhan uh, dictum, as you know, is mm. TV is a cool medium. You, got, you can't be hot, you know, you can't be angry. And O'Toole seemed to be remembering that. And he was calm and cool and collected, whereas Trudeau was just, gesticulating wildly and he looked a little red in the face sometimes a little bit sweaty but he he looked pissed off and i think that it it really ruined his chances at having a better debate because he needed to have a better debate you know o'toole kept using the word leader 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 uh and a lot with referring to himself it, it, do you think that might resonate yeah i think so i think Part of the reason he was doing that is he knows that this election is actually turned into a bit of a referendum on Justin Trudeau. You know, and Trudeau and his war room have been just winded by the fact that but they obviously made an enormous mistake calling an election early. It was unnecessary. It was unwanted. So the referendum question is shifted from, you know, are you angry with Justin Trudeau? Do you, do you think you want to change? People are s seemingly saying yes. So the, the alternative, the only alternative is O'Toole. And I think that's what O'Toole was doing, was presenting himself possibly for the first time to millions of Canadians last night and saying, you know, I kind of look and sound like a prime minister. Why don't you give me a shot? Uh, Jagmeet Singh needed to make inroads with those liberal supporters. And, and did you see him making an impression last night? He did better in the English debate than he did in the two French debates. It was weird. You know, in the French debates, he looked off kilter. He looked off balance, looked uncertain. Whereas I found that uh, last night he seemed to capture some of the strength that we all know that he has. And, uh, you know, that strength is has really him during this election campaign, because you point out, you know, he's taking seats away at this point from Justin Trudeau in the lower mainland, uh, places in Manitoba, and certainly in urban centers. You know, I can think of a four or five ridings in the Toronto area where Justin Trudeau may lose uh, seats, may lose MPs to Jagmeet Singh. So, yeah, I think he did what he had to do last night. And I expect that the NDP will hold on to that 22, 23, 24 percent position they've got in the polls. You know, the, the block has been sliding a bit when you look at the numbers and, and Blanchett last night. He had to make an impression, did he not? Yeah, and, he, you know, a lot of us can't vote for him, but uh, I was watching it with somebody last night and she said, you know, 
he's he's not bad you know he's actually kind of an attractive leader he you know he understands the medium i find you know he was the the former ceo and founder of an entertainment and uh, communications firm in quebec and it really shows you know he's really got those chops and he knows how to do well but you can't vote for him that's i think this one of the big things that happened yesterday uh, just before the debate is quebec premier legault who is the most popular premier in Canada, did something extraordinary. He said that people should be voting in Quebec for Aaron O'Toole, and he called Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau dangerous. You know, I've talked to some people uh, who've been around a long time. That's never happened before. And I think what Legault was doing was trying to put a message in the heads of Jagmeet Singh and, uh, and uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet and saying, we're watching you and if you want to have support in quebec you guys need to be assisting o'toole if he's going to be forming a, a minority government so i think that's going to be the struggle that we're going to see in the coming week is does trudeau go after jagmeet singh uh and, Bl and blanchette or does he try and make them friends because he he's certainly going to need them after the vote and you know there was a demonstration at uh, at the uh, the debate last night outside as supporters of uh, the people's party of canada uh, we're upset that Max Bernier was not part of that debate. Should he have been? I don't think so. I mean, the rules are the rules. And, you know, as, as Bernier himself said, he acknowledged the rules. And, uh, I, you know, obviously he was unhappy with the result. Um, but, you know, last time he got to participate because he met a certain threshold. This time he, he did not. And so, um, you know, the, I think the, the consortium who sets the rules for these debates and people should understand, you know, this because you're a professional broadcaster. It's not the government who sets the rules for these debates. It's the media organizations themselves. And they made a determination that if, you know, you, you open the floodgates to everybody who's got a certain amount, uh, you know, a minuscule percentage in the polls, you're going to be open the doors to too many people. So I understand his anger and his upset, but the rules are the rules. Warren, I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks, my friend. Warren Kinsella is a political commentator and former special advisor to Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. Can debates change a campaign on a dime? Sure, but not often. To get some perspective on whether it will change this one, I'm pleased to be joined by Daryl Ricker, CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs. And, and Daryl, do the debates matter or do they matter more now in a pandemic when there's less canvassing, less face-to-face? Well, I think uh, they don't really matter as much as things like, for example, uh, daily earned media activity. I mean, there's some paid advertising that obviously matters, but also the events that are happening during the course of a campaign have a major influence on what people think. So I think uh, campaign operatives like to think and pundits like to think that events like debates have an impact. But in my experience, basically what they generally do is just reinforce pre-existing ideas that people already had. Did you see any knockout moments in, in last night's debate? No, I didn't. It, it really, what it looked like is, you know, five cage fighters not being allowed to get out of their cage. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was, um, it was uh, a format that was not conducive to spontaneity. Let's put it that way. And spontaneity is what tends to produce uh, mm -hmm. moments during campaigns. It's not something maybe somebody had in the back of their head or whatever that, uh, they'd rehearsed, but uh, it's the spontaneous reactions when people see the real individual reacting to a challenge or a situation that tends to be the most revealing. And a format like that allows almost none of it. And, and do you think that was the problem? The format was not conducive to encouraging dialogue debate? Well, I think, I think that there's a combination of things. One of them is that, uh, uh, you know, you put five leaders on the stage, two of them, one of them, uh, is going to be lucky to win their seat and doesn't really represent anything that you would call in current polling, you know, an, an option to uh, to replace the government, that being the Green Party. And nice as uh, uh, Madam Paul is, I mean, why? And and then the second thing is having somebody like uh, Monsieur Blanchette there who had appeared to have no interest. So if you just move two people off the stage, you increase the opportunity for the other people, even in that format, uh, to have 40% more interaction. 
And I think we all would have benefited from more 40% more interaction. The other part, of course, is why the parade of journalists? I, I, I just don't understand it. Um, uh, you know, we don't want to hear moderators talking, journalists talking, anybody other than the candidates talking. So the format that they created uh, allowed a minimization of that. You know, your column this morning says even more Canadians are upset at having this election. And that was the one question that the prime minister could not answer last night on stage. Will this just turn on the liberals or might a lot of voters just stay home because they don't like this election? Well, it, it, it amounts to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, in the in 2011, Stephen Harper won a majority of a 61 percent uh, turnout. 2015 and 2019, Justin Trudeau won a majority and a minority with close to 70% turnout. So they either need people voting for them, but they especially need people turning up because the people who turn up tend to be people who are in, uh, in, in elections that aren't typical, you know, you get higher turnout, tend to be people who are less attached to the political system, who tend to be those younger voters, the millennials, people that Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh, by the way, are really, and, and the Green Party as well, really trying to strongly appeal to. Uh, and uh, if they're turned off by this campaign, it only helps the Conservatives. You, you expect a different for, uh, tone from, from Justin Trudeau for the rest of this campaign. Uh, how, what will it be like and why do you think that? Well, I think that we're going to see an increasingly uh, strident Justin Trudeau really trying to define what he talked about at the start of the campaign, which was the this two very different directions. He even talked about it last night during the debate, these two very different directions to how Canada is going to emerge uh, from the pandemic. And, and he also said how Canada would manage the pandemic, but how we would also emerge from it. And nobody's listening. <laughs> and and that's that's his problem. I mean, so since the day that this election campaign has 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 been triggered, the obsession among Canadians has been over why we're doing this. So, you know, we released a poll this morning that showed that the number of people who believe in Canada that we shouldn't be having this election during the pandemic has gone from the, the start of the campaign of 56 up to 68 today. I've never seen that happen before. So this campaign has been completely consumed by this. The ballot question uh, that Justin Trudeau wanted uh, has not been operative in this campaign, really. And as a result, he's not being heard. So what do you do when you, you're not being heard? Well, you try to get louder. And, and uh, so I expect that we're going to see a more aggressive Justin Trudeau, similar to what we saw at the debate last night. But I have to be honest. I mean, is that really a good look for him? Is that really a good look for him? He's this Mr. Sunny Ways. He's a guy who makes people feel good about themselves. The left needs to love. He's that lovable, when, he, when he's on his game, he's that lovable emotional connection that people really responded well to, particularly in 2015. So how are they going to respond to a really aggressive, strident, apocalyptic type uh, uh, Justin Trudeau? I don't, I don't know that that's a really good look for him. And, and you feel the liberals are, are boxed in right now between the conservatives and the NDP? Every day they lose a slice to one or the other. And, and uh, so, you know, when we looked at leadership, uh, the, the elements of leadership in, in some of our polling, uh, we looked at, you know, things that relate to confidence. We looked at things that relate to, you know, hope, trust, fear, you know, all those kinds of things. And it seems that what's happened to Mr. Trudeau is he's lost on both ends of that spectrum. So one set of attributes that relate to competence, Justin Trudeau gets a certain, you know, good grades for doing things like, for example, managing the pandemic, but managing the economy, conservatives are well ahead on him. Everything that has to do with compassion in sunny ways, Jagmeet Singh leads, leads on now. Justin Trudeau has a few things that he leads on, but unfortunately they're negative things. Like say, for example, who's most likely to say anything during this election? He's uh, almost 20 points higher than any other candidate. Uh, who's most likely to have a hidden agenda? He leads Aaron O'Toole by six points on that in our most recent polling. That's something that the Conservatives are always well ahead on, but now the incumbent Prime Minister is. And by the way, why would somebody who's been around for six years have a hidden agenda compared to somebody you hardly know? That This is all communicating how Canadians feel about Justin Trudeau, which is that there's a real, um, there's a real trust deficit there right now. And the way the campaign was triggered is the thing that just highlights all of it. Trust deficit. Very, very good term. Daryl, I want to thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Daryl Bricker is the CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs. Now, the federal election debate focused on five issues for the leaders to discuss. David McDonald's a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, and he joins us now. And, and David, the issues that were selected for the debate, do you feel they resonate with Canadians? Those were the ones that they wanted to hear about? 
I think certainly some of them could have. I mean, I don't know how much actual policy content we got into in the debate. Unfortunately, it's a perennial problem with so many people on stage to how do you debate serious issues that affect Canadians uh, and get any deeper than, uh, you know, a quick soundbite. Uh, but certainly, you know, COVID-19 recovery, uh, you know, the, the idea of affordability for households. I mean, these are certainly key issues in the election. I'm not, not sure how far we got into them, but, uh, you know, I think they're interesting issues for sure. Uh, which issues were you looking forward to seeing discussed that did not appear last night? Well, I mean, it, it, it wasn't so much that the, the broad themes uh, were missing, but it was more so that the individual policy discussions simply weren't there. I mean, on the question of affordability, um, you know, a, a substantive debate about childcare, which is a huge, uh, you know, a huge issue among both parties and, and, and uh, both parties, among all parties, and quite differing positions, uh, a more substantive debate on uh, housing policy, for instance, would have been great to see. Um, in terms of the post-pandemic or, or, or recovery, uh, again, you know, I think that the there were questions to this effect, but actually seeing, uh, you know, what are some long-term impacts in terms of how we want to change the EI system? How do we want to support, support unemployed workers? How we want to change the long-term care system in terms of how do we better support um, the provinces in implementing these systems? I mean, a lot of this was very much glossed over and we didn't get into the real details and, and really highlight, I think, for people that are going to the polls uh, this weekend and again, uh, uh, you know, on September 20th, what differentiates the parties and what are some of the substantive differences so people can really decide the, you know, what, what they think is most important on some of these key issues. Did you think anybody made a convincing case for their platform in the debate? Well, I mean, I think that I, I suppose TV uh, debates like this don't necessarily result in, in, in big policy discussions. I mean, I was watching the child care file. It's something I follow quite closely. Uh, it only came up very, very briefly. I mean, there was some debate about how the, the policy platforms differed, but, you know, there, there wasn't, uh, you know, that the tax credit for the conservatives versus more of a $10 a day approach for the liberals and NDP. And I suppose the greens, although the, I, the greens didn't really even get into the discussion. Um, on housing policy, I mean, I, I did think that there was a bit more of a discussion around affordable housing uh, being more of a focus, particularly for the NDPs and the, and the Greens, uh, potentially less so for the Conservatives and the Liberals, which are focused more on the affordability of the purchase of homes. Um, but again, like, you know, discussing how the first time home buyers tax credit or changes in CMHC insurance rates, these are proposals from the Liberals, um, would potentially increase affordability in the short term, but probably not in the long term. You know, I think the discussion too of the foreign buyers, like in essence, prohibiting foreign buyers in the marketplace, there was actually general agreement across most parties that this is desirable and will likely be implemented irrespective of what party is, is, uh, is elected uh, because they've all committed to this already. Uh, and so, it, you know, in that regard, I mean, this is an area of, of unusual agreement across the parties, but you wouldn't know that from, from the debate, unfortunately, last night, which really skated over some of these issues. Um, you know, in terms of uh, recovery on the healthcare side, I mean, there, there was some, there was some I, I think, more in-depth debate around that. Um, you see the Conservative Party in particular uh, advocating for really unrestricted transfers to the provinces where you're not targeting the money to something specific, like, say, long-term care. Um, However, a lot of the new money from the conservative package is really back end loaded. So it really doesn't start to kick in until um, five years out. Um, whereas some of the liberal funding is, is a bit more front end loaded and is a bit more targeted with strings attached. So that, you know, they do want to see the province suspended in particular areas, but they're not as interested in some of the longer term changes uh, in the funding structure of, uh, of, of healthcare in Canada. I mean, unfortunately, without costed platforms for either the Green or the Greens or the NDP, it's very difficult to say you know, what, what they would spend money on because there's no dollar figures attached to it. Um, you know, you certainly see support for health care to some degree and certainly in, in long-term care within those parties. But it, again, it's not clear. You know, it's one thing to say we support this. It's another thing to put billions of dollars behind it and write that down. Uh, and I think that's one of the important pieces of costing a party platform is to not only commit to certain things, but to, to attempt to figure out to what's the scale there? How many billions are you putting behind it? Um, and so we did see some of that, I think, in the debate. But uh, again, in terms of, I mean, this was an interesting question from uh, uh, one of the commentators was, you know, when do these programs wind down, for instance? So, you know, there are these big programs. I mean, you know, this, the CERB, the CRB, the changes in the EI. I mean, in present, they're 
They're going to wind down on October 31st. Uh, the wage subsidy is a big program for business, actually much bigger than the support for, for jobless Canadians. Again, scheduled to, to wind down at the end of, end of October. Um, you know, looking forward, it's pretty, pretty clear that there's the real possibility of a fourth wave. Um, and so, I mean, in my mind, you certainly don't want to be withdrawing these key benefits in the middle of a fourth wave. And so, I mean, this idea of, of, of when these, and, and you know, party leaders, of course, are, are loath to say when they're going to cut, cut benefits off for businesses or, or, or unemployed Canadians. Um, but, it, you know, it's an important discussion about what the parties plan to do at the end of this. Um, what, what survives the pandemic in terms of changes to, say, the AI system or, you know, support for for um, self-employed workers and what doesn't what you I mean what ends on October uh, 31st or maybe a month or two later I, you know that the leaders didn't really get into that I, that's a bit unfortunate because I think that that for a lot of Canadians these have been critical programs for a lot of businesses they've been critical programs um, and so their wind down or their continuance in some form is going to be very important to people and I, we really didn't get into the meat of that in the in the debate last night. Yeah, you mentioned not getting into the meat of the debate or uh, a little more, uh, a little more uh, to and fro. The format did the format throw you off? The format not given enough chance for having you know dialogue and debate. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, every year everyone everyone complains about the format. I'm not sure there's a great format where people say that was really a great debate. You know, this is a debate that really got into the substance of some of these issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a debate of three against one, which was sometimes the format where you'd have one person start and the other person would heckle them for a while. I mean, I'm not sure that's a great format. One on one on one debates, I think, uh, can be can be more can be more useful. I mean, I don't. I actually didn't mind some of the hard questions tailored to the particular issues uh, and tailored to the particular parties. I mean, what are some of the issues around leadership? Uh, you know, and some of those were pretty hard hitting questions. I, you know, they weren't, they weren't lobbing softballs in. Um, I appreciate that. And it is interesting though, to see, to see uh, some of the leaders talk directly to one another and interrogate one another. Although I'm not sure how you get around the problem of uh, people just yelling over each other. Uh, that's unfortunately how a lot of these debates evolve. And the more people that you say have the floor, the more likely it is that people are just going to talk over one another. And I, I mean, in terms of designing the debate, it is it is hard. I mean, I, I remember when I was, you know, back in high school and we would do debates uh, and you were never allowed to just talk over another person. You had your piece of time, the other person, their piece of time. You could have your response and you go back and forth in one or two minute segments. I think that might be a, a more useful way to get at some of these issues as opposed to the people talking over one another, which isn't really that interesting to anyone, unfortunately. David, I want to thank you for joining us. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. David McDonald's a senior economist with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Our unpublished.vote question asks you, do the debates help you make up your mind as to who you'll vote for? Yes, no, or unsure? You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote. I want to thank our guest today on the Unpublished Cafe, political commentator Warren Kinsella, Daryl Bricker from Ipsos Public Affairs, and David McDonald of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And I want to thank you for watching the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.